Hello and welcome to Stay in Your Lane, a recap and review podcast on Serial Experiments Lane. Today we are covering Layer 10, Love. I am your host, Lokomasi, with me is my co-host, Fefner Masamune. And I think it's gonna be a lane lane time. This touchdown brings me around again to find I'm not the lane they think I am at home. Oh no, no. I'm a rocket lane. Anyway, hi, I'm Fefner, and that's pretty much all I bring to this podcast. It's just garbage at the start. Anyway, who else is here? Alice? Um, if you think about it, Lane is really just somebody making an anime about what it's like to be to be awake at 3.30 a.m. trying to get cheese out of the back of the refrigerator. <laughs> and Jenner. If you think about it, Lane's really like having to start the podcast recording over and over again because somebody's audacity doesn't start it the first time. I'll, oh, uh, also oh, you're not going to do a rap that I don't that I don't recognize. Ah, uh, yeah. This time. In the previous uh, uh, attempt at this, I sung uh, some lyrics from the song "The Bad Touch" by the Bloodhound Gang from memory, but then did not completely remember them because the episode title is "Love." You know, like the kind you clean up with a mop and bucket. I'm not gonna do it this time. The one you I, understand. I had the energy. The of. I had the energy to do it once. <laughs> All right, and this episode opens with no opening monologue. It is just silence, as we get the same three shots we do in every episode. Yeah, we watched. Uh, excuse this. me. Uh, everybody's favorite uh, character is talking. That, of course, being the uh, power line noise. Mm-hmm. Fan favorite, fan favorite, mm -hmm. the power line noise. Um, I really the most iconic thing about Lane is power lines and mm -hmm. the noises they make. I just remember when we watched this, Fefner being concerned, and then I remember in the original attempt of us recording this, you asked Alice what she thought of it. I just said, I just said that it was weird. That Lane is so weird that I didn't even realize there wasn't an opening monologue. <laughs> the first dialogue in this episode comes from Deus and Lane. So, I should just explain what happens, what is commonly agreed to have happened before I start describing this scene. Fans believe that Deus and Lane basically switch places for this conversation. As to why they do that, I don't know if I have an answer, because we opened with uh, the ending dialogue from last week's episode, where Masby Eri proclaims himself to be God, and then he immediately says, Why are you God? I don't understand. You're dead, aren't you? A dead human. Somebody like that can't be God, can they? Which, he's talking about himself. I don't want to oversell it, but this is honestly one of the weirder things that Lane does. Lane the show does because if you kind of just let the dialogue wash over you you might not realize what's happening I mean it is kind of it is kind of hard to keep up with not because there's so much going on but just because you're so stuck in the like I was getting over the first thing it can be hard to keep up with for me because I keep falling asleep and then we have to keep rescheduling these my bad um, I did want to ask did anybody pick up on the fact that Ari and Lane had basically switched places in the conversation. I just assumed, and we're saying what the other should have been I saying. Actually, just I did as, not. I just assumed that like Lane was puppeting them, or they were puppeting her. <laughs> they took. They were puppeting each other. Yeah. <laughs> at the same time, which just confused everyone. They both thought, "I will show how strong I am by taking control of their body," and then went, "Well, shit." Yeah, exactly. Did that whole God thing of let's go. And then they're like, well, shit. It was like, it's like playing rock, paper, scissors and both throwing rock and being like, well, now what? We both <laughs> use the best one. What do we do now? No, the best one is scissors because lesbians. But anyway. But nothing beats rock. Uh, nothing beats scissoring. Amazing. Thanks. Let's see. <laughs> I don't want to actually read all the lines that I wrote down like I've been doing because this is kind of a long scene and it's just kind of a, a nonsense nightmare. So, I'm glad God is here and all, and he looks like this, but, like, what if they didn't go with the OC scientist as the g God and, I guess, the antagonist? What if it was just Ted Nelson? <laughs> Ted Nelson. And he just looked the same. You just have this very detailed man's face. <laughs> they just did this 
with a real historical human being who is still alive today, I think. Yep. Just wanted to will that into existence anyway. Yeah, Alright, so important things that... Oh, you had something to say, Jenner, I forgot. Oh, um, all I was going to say is I recall pointing out that it's so weird that this person is claiming to be God because I presume that this show is like kind of drawing its uh, like theology from multiple religious sources not just christianity and like this idea of god as like the single entity like a mono god is very um like christian monotheistic whereas this kind of i don't know like i didn't ever think that lane had started to get super christian it was kind of like dipping its hands into many theological pots until just now and like all this like christian stuff that alice and i mostly alice have been joking about has just been us joking uh but now it's starting mm -hmm. to get like ever since the episode where like lane appeared in the sky it's been starting to get more and more christian it's again Reminding me of Neon Genesis Evangelion, where the Christian symbolism just starts to, like, become a <laughs> lot more. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, to be fair, 90% of the Christian symbolism in NGE isn't actually symbolism. It's just there to look cool. Mm -hmm. Like, one of the weapons is just called the Lance of Longinus. Why? Because it's a cool-sounding name. No other reason. I call my dick the Lance of Longinus. I don't have a dick, Because <laughs> I used it to kill Jesus. Yeah. Because if I Christ. did have a dick, I would use it to kill Jesus. Do you know how many right, people named right, Jesus so... there are on Earth? I'm just saying, I have a busy time ahead of me. <laughs> I just gathered my thoughts and then you obliterated them again. Speaking of obliterating thoughts, my dick. So, so they reiterate the uh, point about not needing a body to survive. Mm -hmm. And that you can survive entirely on the wired as information. Uh, which... Lane recognizes as what Chisa said. I'm also confused about which character to refer to, given the whole implied body swap thing. Uh, Ari um, states that when he wrote Protocol 7, or 6, or whichever one we're currently on, he encoded his memories into it, which allowed him to exist on the Wired before dying, and allowed him to exist completely on the Wired after. When Lane asks him, what do you think a being like that should be called? He responds, a god. And Lane says, but there is no god. Wow. Well done, Lane. Deus responds with, yes. Even if I were omnipresent, it could influence others. With no followers, I am not a god. god so Deus here and Lane says, without a follower, you cannot, like, without followers, all the power in the world means nothing. You cannot be a god without followers. I have a problem You're just a with really that. strong dude. Yeah, I have a problem with that. Like, if you have omnipotent power, it doesn't matter whether or not people believe in you or not. You can do god shit. For me, like, if you're yeah. a god and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sense? Yeah, if you're a god and nobody's around to believe in you, it doesn't make you a god. Yes. Look, I work on the Ghostbusters principle, where was, if somebody asks me if I'm a god, I say yes. Um, I was going to mention this reminded me of. Uh, the amoeba dialogue from Akira, which might be one of the most misunderstood things in that anime, if not just an anime in general, where, and it's been long enough that I forgot the name of everybody in Akira. Uh, the female lead of Akira is talking about... God, I can't even remember what she's talking about, but basically <laughs> she makes a comparison to amoebas and then, you know what, fuck it. <laughs> I'm too disoriented, I'm too goddamn tired to talk about this. I was going to say... That the I'm, point of the okay, of the ahead. monologue in Acura is that if an amoeba had all the powers of a human, it wouldn't make it a human. It would just make it a really strong amoeba. It would use all of its knowledge and powers to just eat and destroy, because that's all amoebas do. And if a human had the power of a god, it wouldn't make them a god. They would just be a strong human, and they would just do the things that humans do, but be better at it. Eri is trying to circumvent that by saying, there are things I have to do to be a god that aren't just be strong. Yeah, I guess like, I need to have followers. Ares, I need to have a religion. Yeah, Ares is saying that you need to have believers to be a god. Like there's god qualifications. Sorry, folks. 
you got to tick off X number of boxes before you can be a god. I argue that this isn't, like, I, I have two statements to make here, and I'll try to keep them short, which is, no, I mean, that's not how it works. I have this very, like, broad idea of human, wherein there is human the species, and there is human the trait. Human the species, yeah, you know, you know what a human is when you see it. Human the trait is different, and things can, things that aren't human the species can be human the trait. So when you see, like, those heartwarming stories of, like, a cat raising ducklings, or whatever, that is a cat being human in my, or like when you he, like hear these heartwarming stories of murder wasps like clearing out an entire area of honeybees, that's murder wasps being human, because humans do that too. But like in that way, they can be human. They, like when, like doing, like just going out and consuming things is actually something that humans do. Uh, I don't like this idea of that like only like people who like you know, walk on, t oh, what is it, what is the Diogenes, uh, only, like, flesh, like, f featherless, uh, mammals, uh, featherless yeah, bipeds. yeah, featherless bipeds can be humans, and then, like, you just throw a plucked chicken in there and be like, behold, a man, yeah, I don't like that kind of qualifications, I believe that there is the human species, but that the ability to be human and be humane exists in a lot of species, it's an evolutionary trait. Uh, additionally, I have, like, this weird, complicated, like, like, th thing going on with what I think is kind of being said here, which is that Aerie needs validation to, like, feel uh, justified in living. Like, they need that praise and adulation, or it's not worth it. They need that external validation for whatever reason, and... Or they're not them, right? If it, it's again, if it's it's that tree falling in the woods, but for reals, they need that person to hear their sound. And for me, like as like dealing with the stuff that I deal with in life, and I said I try and make this short, so I'm so sorry. I I mentor a lot of young people. I've told you too about this, and I deal with a lot of queer and trans young people who wrestle with this, where they need that validation, they need those head pats, and without that, they don't think that they can count or qualify as being what they are without that external validation, without passing. And for me, as an older queer person, it's just like, no, fuck other people, fuck their applause, fuck the people in the bleachers, you are you. If you're standing up there on the field in a football costume, like in a football uniform, it doesn't fucking matter what uniform you're wearing or what you're wearing at all. You know, you're playing the fucking game and it doesn't matter what the people in the bleachers say, you're there. And it was a shitty metaphor, but yeah, like, I don't like this idea that you need, like, fucking somebody else's permission to be who you are or that you need somebody to say, wow, look at you, thumbs up, in order to, like, count. So, yeah, but at the same time, I do recognize how important that is to have that confirmation. So, sorry that that took so long, but yeah, that's where I'm at on There's this. one problem with this. Yeah. He's talking about specifically being a god. Right, but I'm drawing it to, like, this smaller scale thing. I also don't think, look, if, a, if god actually existed, I don't think god exists, by the way, they wouldn't need our adulations to be a god either. They would just, ha like, a, per a human being with god power would be able to do god things. Uh, I, oh, had, I had this argument look with back my over spouse what I about this, where, like, human beings anthropomorphizing god don't, like, human beings don't understand divine and, like, the lengths and limitations of what divine is. But it's just, like, it's not like humans don't experiment and wouldn't, uh, like, find something beyond human that they could do if they had God powers. I don't know. I'm weird in this way in that there's a reason God doesn't exist because if, if God did exist, we would have killed God already. That's where I'm at. We humans. All right, I was trying to look over what exactly they say in the conversation. I couldn't remember if they said, like, worshippers or believers. Apparently they said followers. So they have to worship and be with days. 
they have to believe in and be with Deus. If it was just they have to believe in Deus, well, that's ambiguous. Yeah. If nobody thinks you're a god, then I understand what he's trying to say. If nobody thinks I'm a god, then I'm just a really powerful human. Mm. I need people to think I'm a god in order to... Uh, the scene ends with Deus saying, you no longer need a body, Lane, because we haven't repeated that enough. This is also, I feel like, the first time in the series that they acknowledge Shisa again. Because Lane, or Deus' body, but I think it's supposed to be Lane's dialogue, uh, responds to Ares saying that dying is merely abandoning the flesh, but that's just what Shisa said. Another thing I wanted to point out about this scene uh, is that in both the dubs I watched, the voice actors kind of imitate the other's voice, not perfectly. Uh, but Kirk Thornton as Airy puts on a very high pitch, not quite a falsetto, but it's like somebody asked him to do a little girl voice and he said, I can't do that. And they said, we'll do it anyways. Um, whereas Bridget Hoffman as Lane is definitely deeper and more grandiose sounding. They're trying to imitate each other, but it's not a perfect imitation. I forgot what I was going to say, so you can just keep going, but it actually was important, so I probably should have just finished saying it, because I don't have this, you don't have the problem for getting things as bad as I do. Ugh. You were going to say something in response to Chisa being mentioned again? Maybe. It, it's, like, it didn't really have much to do with Chisa, though I'm glad she got back up again, because, again, you know that I believe that she was important to Lane, even though Lane doesn't remember her. I talked about how trauma and depression can eat your memories, right? Already, I think mm -hmm. it's like a thing that can happen. But no, that wasn't what I was going to go into because I think I already talked about that. Uh, I don't remember what it was and I'm upset about it. If I remember, I'll shout it back out again, but I'm not gonna. The next scene is back to the classroom. Uh, Lane goes to class and nobody really acknowledges her, not even Alice. Also, her desk is gone. Nobody really finds this strange and the teacher doesn't acknowledge it. Oh, right. I remember the first thing. And then I remember the second thing. The first thing was, I remember in that scene, quipping when uh, Ari says, we don't need bodies. But that's, I mean, sometimes. But some people do. Because without a body, you can't have physical sex. If you want to physically fuck, you need a body. And at this scene that we're just getting into now, I quipped, and I want to say it now so I don't forget later. This reminds me of those nightmares that you can, I often had, and other people have said they had, where they show up at class completely unprepared for like a really important assignment uh, presentation that's like 100% like of their grade, and they're like naked. That this reminds me of those nightmares, except it's even worse. And the prom's tomorrow. Body. Yeah. Eventually, Lane has an outburst, saying, "I'm real. I'm alive. I'm here. Why is this happening? Was it something I did? I always try to keep this from happening. Am I not supposed to have a body?" And then Alice says, "That's right, Lane. You're not needed in the real world." So this isn't real, right? This is some fucked up thing that Ari did, right? Yeah, Alice would never. That's, I think that's sort of the tip off. Is this Nega um, Alice? This is not my beautiful wife. This is not my beautiful home. <laughs> I mean, it's little, that's literally what's happening, though. Like, <laughs> you may find yourself as a god of the internet world, and you may find yourself like under the wheel of a large train. Jokes aside, there's something deep, kind of heartbreaking about watching Lane just stare where her desk is supposed to be. Oh, this scene is horribly sad. It's just genuinely really heartbreaking. Like, wow, I know, like, there's a lot of weird shit happening, but it just breaks through the weird shit and just is really sad to watch everyone ignore her completely. She's like, getting hardcore bullied. It's just really sad, you guys. Yep. The person... Uh, who recommended this show to me is non-binary and this show is one of the things that helped them realize that gender is fake and it was they admitted by their own admission it was in a very fucked up way in that this constant refrain of I'm not real I don't need my body 
and I don't belong here trauma that is being inflicted upon Lane made that person reflect on do they belong here? Do they belong in their body? Are they real? And then they are like, oh shit, I can just be whatever. And so at least they got something positive out of it. One person's trauma is another person's nirvana. Mm -hmm. uh, the next scene has Lane going home. No one is there. One of the bedrooms is a mess. For some reason I have a note that it might be Mika's, but I don't really know. I guess I think it's Mika's because there's not a ton of computers in it, but there's nobody else living there. There's conflicting evidence of whether like they suddenly left a half hour ago or if they just hadn't been living there for months. It's like I think there are things like dead plants and spoiled food, but there's also just like half clean dishes. Uh, finally, Lane's dad shows up. He says, this is goodbye, Miss Lane. You must have figured it out by now. Our work here is finished. It was only for a short time, but I wasn't able to do enough for you. You're now free to become anything you want. No, you were free all along. I wasn't given permission to say goodbye, but I loved you. It's not that I enjoy playing house. Maybe I envy to being like you. Goodbye. And then he walks out of the room and down the stairs, and after a couple of moments of hesitation, Lane shouts, Wait, don't leave me alone, and runs after him. And then Yasuo says, alone, you're not alone. If you connect to the Wired, everyone will come to you. That's the sort of being you are. And the scene ends. You gotta use the power of friendship and also the internet lane. Come on. I mean, there's a difference You're not between, finding a gun in this continuity. There's a difference between, like, knowing people and being friends with people. A lot, like... We, mm -hmm. I've made close relationships on the internet. You, you know, you all can attest that you are some of my close relationships on the internet. But the truth is, sometimes people that you meet on the internet really are just randos who you could give or take. So there's a difference between, like, a bunch of weirdos on the internet and your fucking family. You, it's, like, for me, my family was super, super abusive. But for some people, it wasn't. And the people on the internet, for me... Mm -hmm were actually the decent people in my life. But for some people, they're just awful randos. And for some people, <laughs> they don't even get any of that. They get awful randos on the internet, and they get shitty family in real life. My point is that, like, having connections and having relationships are important, and having intimate, like, attachments to other people are important. And you can't just get that from, like, everybody. And if you had that level of relationship with everybody... I can't fathom that existence because it's really exhausting to have like that high mm -hmm. level of mo emotional investment with many, many people. We all have our cap. That's all. Thanks. You say that, but what does God need? Followers. Where can you get followers? Twitter. <laughs> That's true. Get I mean, Twitter. followers <laughs> are kind of like having a cat. You know, this is really, this is really, this episode is about chasing clout. Yeah, Lane right. doesn't um, exist anymore because she was just uh, removed from the timeline and thus the Twitter timeline as well. Lane okay, is actually a so, Twitter bot. So is is this whole thing happening? Like, I think so. I still don't know. I don't. I'm want pretty it to be convinced. Happening. I'm pretty convinced the classroom scene was some weird construct within the Wired. Or that Aerie is sending her subliminal messages or something, because I just don't think Alice would do that. Because, like, Alice has not talked about the real world in that context. There's no reason for her to suddenly say, like, yeah. you don't need a body. If she was actually mad at Lane, she would have just said, like, you can fuck off. But this, Yasuo is acting the way that Yasuo has. Very ambiguously. I honestly cannot believe that Alice would ever say, Alice in the show would ever say a cuss. I think Alice would wring her hands and be like, this, you're distressing me a lot and you're not the kind of person I could stay friends with. She wouldn't say fuck you. She would feel really, really bad that she had to sever. Uh, I don't know. I think Alice has a vindictive streak. I think she is one bad day away from clocking somebody and calling him a bitch ass motherfucker. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you just do need to call somebody a bitch ass motherfucker. Like when Lane or later sometimes you need to do it over Twitter. To no, I need to stop referencing it. <laughs> stop referencing the meme. It's done. It's fine. We can move on. But yeah, this scene. 
So one of the things that Jenner and I disagree on is whether Yasuo is a villain or not. I don't think he's a villain. I think he's working for some people with less than good intentions. He very clearly refers to having people sent here and or, uh, people who have sent him here and he refers to people that he needed to get permission from that he didn't. So he's working for someone and they might not be nice. But I think ultimately Yasuo saw the opportunity to be a good dad and decided to at least try. As the great philosopher, uh, uh, wow, God, what's their name? Hell Puppy 1210 once said, uh, capitalism makes simps of us all. You know, Yasuo, I hope that's his name, has bills to pay, uh, a life to live, maybe mouths to feed, and we don't, because of the nature of capitalism, we don't always get to choose who we work for. We gotta get that paycheck to pay those bills, to fill that fridge, because, you know, capitalism is awful, and really, things like fresh water and food and shelter and healthcare should just be free. So you don't have to do these things. You don't have to, you know, uh, give up your dignity and work for something you don't believe in or that you that will complicate you and compromise you ethically to do in order to, like, make ends meet. But I would argue that, like, look, I have had some history with interacting with, off and on, a handful of uh, religious groups that I would actually say are fucking cults. And when you are the person who is facilitating a fucking cult, and that is your way of bringing in the bread, you're not, like, regardless of your situation, you're not a good person because you are victim, like, you are working for an organization that exists to victimize other people on this level that a lot, but not all, normal employment does not. So in that, Yasuo has chosen this. When he could have maybe chosen something different, makes me sus on him. It's kind of like those people who work for the Department of, hum like, you know, Human Services or uh, ICE or, or our cops, right? The fact that they have made that choice to be a fucking cop or an ICE agent or whatever uh, means that they are now bastards and they are scum and I don't care why they chose to do that. I care that they chose to do that. Uh, I think what I was going to say about Yasuo is that I think his job was to get Lane on the wired and push her to this idea that she should permanently move to the wired and things like that. But I think he chose to do it in the most positive way possible. He constantly talked about the uh, the benefits of being online. And when she started to be consumed by the internet in the earlier episodes, he actually tried to talk her out of it. In a way, Yasuo reminds me of the Mormon elder who told me to stay the fuck away from the Mormon faith after I helped both his son and his daughter stop being addicted to drugs and stop being suicidal. Yasuo reminds me of that man. Was he... Do you think that he was telling her that early on, if he was, genuinely trying to get her to not, you know, indulge the wire? Do you think that he was doing that because he did not want her to, like, muscle in on his territory? If he's like the other... He realizes that he's part of something evil, and he doesn't want her to be part of it, so he just gives her this warning. If he's like how you're like suggesting he's like, then yeah, it's more about, I've got a good cake here, and I don't want to share it. Also, it's the Department of Homeland Security, not the Department of Human Services. My brain flaked out on that. Anyway, continue. I was going to say what he said, but he... The exact phrase that I remember him saying was, the wired and the real world are not the same place. You have to maintain a, dis a distinction between the two. So he was trying to push her to use the internet for its the purposes it was created for, but not to go full-blown become the god of the internet. And Lane resisted that. And you could say, if you have a teenager 
and you want them to do something, tell them not to do it. But I don't think he thinks like that. I don't think Yasmo was playing five-dimensional chess. Uh, do you have a thing that you think he's actually doing here, or do you think it's just I, as simple as, I don't want you to be here, go away? I think he's actually trying to look out for Lane's interest, but her situation is so weird, and he is so not equipped to do it, that he's just not succeeding at it. I mean, yeah, I could definitely see that. I feel like the reason uh, Lane's mom is such a horrible shit stain of a human being is to draw attention to how much Yasuo is actually trying. There's also, I don't know how much evidence there is for it in the show, but there's also the theory that Lane's family are not real people, but are like programs that were created to take care of her. And if that's the case, then they programmed Yasuo to be a good dad, and he decided to care about that above any other programming he had. I don't know if I think that's the case. I think he's. I think he, the mom and Mika, are real human beings that were hired. And Yasuo just decided to, like, ditch the main goal and decide to be a good dad for whatever reason. Lane's family are just paid actors. I just... Uh... <laughs> No, yes, and man, it sucks to be Mika. This is a what is your bar? Yasio, Yasio, uh, he's probably trying to like to give to assume the best faith. He's probably trying to be the best dad he can be, but this is not really that great of parenting. He's really not that supportive of her or emotionally available to her. He's very creepy and distant and detached to her, except when he's warning her about these things he knows about. Again, I have a lot of experience being a parent towards children, and you don't have to play fifth dimensional chess with kids if you just develop a good relationship with them. You don't have to play this reverse psychology shit. You can just speak frankly with them about why you think they shouldn't do thing and how why and like without having to do this fucking game shit. And so no, Yasuo isn't like the bar is very, very low. Yasuo isn't a terrible father. He's not like horribly abusive, but he is neglectful, absentee, distant, and only really like talks to her when he's lecturing to her. Very little like Oh, you're doing sweet, you know, good, sweetie. Very little, like, of the wholesome parenting. Only really shows up when we got a problem. That's, like, that's not a full parent. That's not a good parent. That's just a baseline, like, expectation. And for me, as somebody who is a surrogate parent to way too many people, that's just too low of a bar. Do better. We then cut to another scene. I have it labeled as Lane in cyberspace because I don't know where else it could be. Uh, Lane is standing in a three-way crosswalk. She asks if the knights made the fake her. Someone responds and says that's possible. They've used the collective unconscious long before the wired existed. Lane wants to know the identity of the knights. Um, she's asked why, and she says the use is a god because he has worshippers. We then cut to Siberia. Siberia is completely empty. No DJ. No no evidence that there ever was a club here. Taro's friends want him to leave because they're tired of hanging out on the bottom floor of a warehouse, apparently. Everybody moved on but to Taro... a new platform, and it's just these handful of people still using MySpace. Continue. <laughs> uh, but Taro isn't really paying attention to them because he's staring at his screen. The knights have been fucking doxxed. This is one of my favorite plot developments in the whole show. Lane just doxxes the knights. Mm -hmm. Well, that's prophetic. Uh-huh. <laughs> and because this is a fictional world, there are consequences for this. We first... Our first actual reaction, we cut to the CEO, who just jumps out of his seat in terror and immediately starts shoving things into a briefcase. I mean, if there are people trying to use the sort of, like, m manipulate vast mass communication, 
you know they have to have enemies. Yeah, that's sort of the thing. In a worse show, it would have just been like a generic uh, public support turned against them. But no, in this show, they have the men in black come and kill him. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a different shadowy organization that's doing the dirty work. Knock, knock, open up the door, it's real. <laughs> By it, I mean you getting shot. Goodbye. Knock, knock, it's Knuckles. Psych, it's Carl. No, and he's here to Knuckles. kill you with a lethal injection. <laughs> Knuckles just fucking opens up your door and shoots you in the face. And murders you immediately. I was just saying, watching the knights get doxxed reminds me of what it feels like to be on... It reminds me of the feeling of being... Following, like, live news footage stuff. Like, it reminds me of Euro, like things like Euromaiden and things like that where you're following along the live streams as something really big and perpent- like momentous is happening really far away from you, and you don't actually know that much about it, but you feel like you know a lot because you're just imbibing this information just raw in huge amounts. Mm-hmm. So that's what just that whole scene just gives me that feeling. Uh, we cut to the other nice members that we know of, so Gabe Newell and the housewife. They're also all dead. The methods of their death are not entirely clear. Um, All of them are reported as being suicides, even though at least one was a murder. We saw that on screen. So were all of them misreported murders? Were some of them? It's not clear. It's not super important. It's just the housewife died at her computer and spilled her coffee. So if she was murdered, then the knights just, I don't know, delivered a lethal shock through her laptop or something. I don't know what they could have done. They shot her in the chair, she fell over, and then they just knocked over her coffee out of spite. (laughs) And the kid did not notice this at all, despite being in the same room. He really likes his video game is the thing. What if if he was on the phone, but too much? (laughs) <laughs> this is what boomers think happens when you're on the, on a computer for too long. I mean, just the, keel over. the spilled coffee makes me think that um, she was poisoned, but I don't know. The timing doesn't work. It's all just weird. Yeah. A weird thing in Serial Experiments Lane. Who could have imagined? Uh, we then cut to Lane in the real world. She has wires on her. She has some sort of wires stuck on her lower lip. It's the most noticeable one, but she is <laughs> she is reaching new levels of online with each passing episode. That's what it looks like when you post too much. <laughs> <laughs> She's gone beyond terminally online. <laughs> or you could call it terminally online too. She is the internet. <laughs> she is not online. She <laughs> is online. Um, Elaine has, she looks very distraught despite the fact that she's just brought about a better timeline by murdering the entirety of Anonymous. Uh, the men in black enter her room and Lane asks why they murdered them. They respond that it was a request from their client. Now, and now that Lane had hunted down the members, the men in black were free to murder them. Uh, Carl says the wired cannot exist as a special world. It can only be a subsystem that reinforces the real world. You can't be allowed to exist in the Wired either, but here you are. Some god must be protecting you. Irie's thoughts will be purged from the Wired. Our clients are rewriting Protocol 7. We have no need for gods, in the Wired or the real world. Uh, Carl then removes his eye gear again. He says, we still haven't figured out what you are either, but I love you. Love certainly is a strange emotion, isn't it? And then he leaves. No time to deal with that. No answers for anyone. Just a very uncomfortable scene, and then we're gone. I mean, seeing her like that, I've got to ask, like, was everything her being plugged in like this? Like, the... No. Or at least some of it was. Yeah, I think... it's It ties into the ever-expanding computer nest that Lane has. As she gets more online, she goes from using a keyboard to using vocal commands, and now she's hooking her brain up to the computer. What do you make of the Love Story is a Strange Emotion? I don't know. (laughs) 
I I don't know why Carl even cares about Lane. I feel like he cares about her because I mean they've been watching her. She's been under surveillance, and I, I feel like I, I'm tempted to say that it's a moment of human of just him being a person that like he can't help but feel bad for her because I mean she is just a little girl like she she's just mm-hmm. a she's a, she's a a schoolgirl like. She didn't ask to be involved in all kinds of crazy bullshit that she didn't understand. Like, you know, there's some sympathy there. And, like, there's a sympathy of that nature, it, compassion, true compassion. It's not not love. It's not exactly what we would call love, but it's related enough that, you know, that can be really genuine. And maybe that's him realizing that, yeah. Whether he wanted it to or not, he does actually kind of feel this way. Yeah. Kind of in the same way that whether Lane wanted to or not, she became an axle, like a the round which other things turned, or whatever. That, I'm sorry, become that's that which you hate. The oppressor, the oppressed, has now become the oppressor. Yeah, some things, some things are bigger than us, and we become a part of them, whether we want to or not. And we end up feeling the way that ways that we do, whether we wanted to originally or not. Mm-hmm. I think the point of this scene to me might be one to tempt Elaine with the possibility that Airy could be destroyed once and for all. We could just we have his followers out of the picture; they're going to rewrite protocol to remove all the iry bits we can get rid of him forever but then the men in black will leave and one of them has just told lane that he loves her and i'm just staring at my notes and i realized that as i was staring at them yeah something happens in the last scene that's important yeah i was gonna ask you about that too but uh, uh let's lane there. lane goes back to the street with days I keep switching between referring to it as Deus and Airy. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to stop doing that. Deus is kind of what he calls himself, but sometimes I say Airy to, so that everybody remembers who I'm talking about. Uh, Deus has no one to pray to him, so he can't be a god. But he says he still has some followers. As long as one person believes in him, he'll continue to exist. And Lane is that someone. Mm-hmm. She was born in the Wired, the heroine of the Wired's fairy tales. The real Lane is merely a hologram, a a humunculus of ribosomes. She never had a body to begin with. Fake family, fake memories, fake friends. Poor Lane. She's all alone. But I'm here. The man who loves you is here. You should be able to love me, the man who sent you into this world. Love me. All right, Lane? That isn't another you. That's the real you. Lane responds with, like that even matters, and destroys the telephone wires near her, and then the episode ends. So what did you want to ask me, Alice? When I... So I started to wonder if Mr. Man in Black and Deus are actually connected in a way that we don't yet know about. Because it's weird Hmm. that they both... They both say something about loving Lane, but... It's so very different in how it's expressed. Like, Man in Black says, comments on the fact that he finds that he loves Lane, but is also aware of the fact of how weird that statement is. You know, like, if the, the human heart is a weird thing, and our emotions are weird, and leaves. Whereas this guy says he loves Lane, and then goes into... And also, you are, like, your physical being is something that was, came after you. Like, you you were a mind before you were a body in a mind. Mm -hmm. Like, they go two very different directions. Do we think there's any kind of, do you think those are related, either thematically or um, in, in Hubert's? I don't think that there is a, like, in fiction relationship between Carl and Ari. I can't go into why, but I have very good reason to believe that, and that reason will be apparent as we watch the episodes. Okay, fair enough. As for a thematic reason, well, I think the reason that Carl says, I love you, and then leaves is that he's he's basically saying, you know, once we get rid of Aerie, the next thing would be to get rid of you, but we can't, so we're just going to leave. You know, we're not going to be a part of your life anymore. So he says, I love you, and then leaves, 
implicitly he's leaving forever. Uh, scene before that, Yasuo, well, not just before that, but a scene that happened before that. Yasuo tells Lane that he loves her and then leaves forever. So in the last scene, when Eri says, I love you and I'm here, he's basically, he's trying to convince Lane to protect him from the Men in Black, or whatever threats he has. Realizes at this point, probably, that Lane could actually take him out if he if she wanted to, so he has to convince her that she doesn't want to do that. Like, Men in Black would leaving... Like, the content... What it means that they leave is kind of feels like it's different, too, because, like, when the Men in Black leaves, it is explicitly a, you know, me leaving means that you are safe from me. I'm not going... Yeah, it's we're a not good thing if you. they leave. Yeah, it's a good thing. We are leaving, and I'm glad that we are leaving, and we are not going to see us again, and that's for your benefit. I don't know that I could say that exactly with the dad, but the dad saying I love you and leaving also... I, I So I don't say this 100%, but it kind of feels like this is not the worst thing, in the sense that her family has just... They have ignored Lane so much Mm -hmm. and obviously she has deep emotional needs that they have just refused to fill but the one person in that family who kind of felt like he at least tried a little bit was her dad and then i don't know him leaving here is good in the same way as the men in black leaving but it doesn't feel anywhere near as bad as deo saying it yeah yeah, Yasuo saying that and Carl saying that do feel completely different. If only because Yasuo is at least, you know, in name her father. And Carl is just some middle-aged dude. Who's probably spent a long time um, on this. Like, it seems like he's spent a long time on this, at this assignment. Yeah, 13-year-old girl. Maybe you shouldn't be telling if that to children you're not related to. I, I can't help but read it as a kind of um, he, this assignment seems like it's been a long assignment, and he it's like he got weirdly attached because when all you have to do is monitor this strange alien child, you can't help but <laughs> he couldn't just he just couldn't help but feel kind of attached. She was just weird and alien and kind of harmless, and that's kind of endearing there we, much like how we, how we watch lane and we get attached yeah we we're humans we pack bond like really easily like we we adopt roombas into our family we'll we'll pack bond with anything there is one thing i wanted to say about the scene with alice that i didn't say at the time because i wanted more setup so the major characters in lane's life tell her that they love her and then leave except alice i think because, because one, I think that scene was fake. I think that was airy. And two, I don't think he could come up for a reason for Alice to leave and actually make her leave permanently. So instead, he takes away Alice's love by having her say, I don't love you. Implicitly. She doesn't say that exact phrase. But she does say, you're not needed in the real world. It's also one of the few scenes involving Lane to not really mention the word love in this episode. It does feel, but it feels like it's implied there. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was getting at. It was on purpose. It was yeah, I can see trying that. to show a vision of Alice not loving Lane. The false Alice. Reject the false Alice. Fake Alice. Fear the, fear Alice. the old one. Yes. Nope, nope, don't like that. Nope. Didn't think about that before I said it. What? What? I combined fake and Alice. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Probably doesn't work in this context. Perfect. 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 (laughs) Wrap that up. Ship it. It's done. (laughs) Okay. You want to think about things before you say them? Never. (laughs) Just say it. You're two episodes too late with that one, anyway. (laughs) I'm still. I'm still not sure how to feel about. I don't know. I'm still not sure how to feel about the various sort of goodbyes. Yeah, I don't have an answer, but for some reason, I'm the only one trying to give you one. I still have a little bit of affection for her dad. That's that, I mean, that's part of it. Like, he still feels like he was yeah, the too. one person in her family who did actually genuinely connect with her in any real way. I, I said I don't think they're programs, but I kind of waver on whether he exists outside of this job or not. In what kind of form he exists in. Because if he is some sort of weird experimental AI... That jumped at the chance to be a dad, then I could 
then his character actually makes perfect sense. Or even if he's a human, a human who is hired to do this, the character of Lane's dad seems to be somewhat transitory. And I'm sorry, it just occurred to me, even if he really is Lane's dad, like being Lane's dad is just a role, you know. Like mm -hmm. being who this guy is, being. That's actually kind of true of all of these. Like, they're saying goodbye, I love you, and leaving, except for Deus, and it's like, because these people's roles in Lane's life are, to a degree, not a necessary fact of the universe. The, like, and Lane is, Lane is having to learn in real time that your parents are not these demi demigod-like beings who control things. They're just humans, and they leave, or they die, or whatever. The position of your parent is not a universally necessary thing that has to happen. And, and you know, that's, that's terrifying. Makes, that may, that's what makes Yasuo, Yasuo special, is that, like, he at least tried. Lane's mom is just there. Literally, she's just there to fulfill the role of Lane's mom she doesn't have anything else to do every seed intensely upset that she's in the scene like and, and lane herself ends up being in this position with alice where like lane is exposed to the idea that her position as as st student is temporally limited you're not in that same desk forever you have to leave there will not be a place for you here Time you know, doesn't you stop have to graduate. for anybody, no matter yeah. what situation you're in, time keeps going. And you, like, uh, my advice is don't just sit there and let life, let your clock run out. My unsolicited it, it, advice. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's literally what's happening. It's all these clocks are just running out all at once. And then we get to Dios, and it's the one that's the different. And he's the one that says he's going to be there forever. And of course, this is the one that's the most wrong, is the one that pretends as if he is temporally and, and physically necessary. Like, you can't get along without me, is how he's positioned himself in her life. I am, an, I am intrinsically mm -hmm. a part of you being a thing. I will admit, there is a point where all the heady shit kind of takes a back seat and we get back to characterization and emotions and then I can talk comfortably about things again. But this is Lane at its most heady, at its most plot-focused and philosophy-focused, is less concerned with the characters and more concerned with these weird philosophical questions and weird plot events. I mean, it is concerned with a character. It's concerned with Lane. It's character. concerned with Lane, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Like, we, I, I can talk all I want to about sort of, like, Lane realizing the nature of time moving, but it's Lane that, you know, that, that really experiences those things. It's like, yeah, Lane, this is what the I whole was series is, like, Lane into. happening things. Yeah, like, it's happening to Lane, but, like, for these, you know, academic types, for these researchers, for these scientists, make, taking this to, like, a smaller scale, who approach these kinds of things... That actually fucking happened to people. You know, epidemiologists, virologists, you know, cult researchers, psychologists who research these things that actually fucking happen to people as if they're just, like, subjects of interest to them that they can just study and research and they can go to, like, this magical discourse space where they can just talk about these quote-unquote abstract concepts. They're abstract to them, but that shit is happening to people. That dot... On your graph, that dot on your ba your bell curve is a fucking person. And just because it's only Lane that it's happening to isn't not pissing me off about this. That's all. Uh, unless somebody else has something to talk about, I think I'm out of things to talk about for this episode. Uh, yeah, I think I I think I expended my ammunition right there. <laughs> Fafner, go, go, say something, go. Something. Nice, thanks. <laughs> you can't just do that to people. Yeah.
I mean, it doesn't I, work. I, I shouldn't just do that to people. Well, I can do that to people, just will not get the results I desire. Though, that was actually the result I desired. <laughs> Thank you, Fafner. All right, Jenner, you want to ask your question? Hey, Alice, what are your feelings about Alice this episode? As the foremost I, expert on Alice. I am kind of distraught. Alice was a me- so it, like Alice was kind of cruel to Lane in a way that's very unlike her, and I don't like it. It is very upsetting. Very upsetting. Zero out of ten would not like this. This is the false Alice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which means it's time for my bit. What's the plot? Uh, Alice, what do you think the plot is? I think the plot of this episode is that Deus has re- things have come to a head with Lane's in court, like integration of herself into the internet and Deus realizes that the only thing that can really kind of stop him is well Lane and to put kind of head that off before it gets to be a problem he has decided to both torment her and also pr- provide her with an enemy that she can actually destroy so that and the end of it all, having not actually accomplished anything, she will feel like the only person she can really believe in is him, whether she likes him or not. And this is like a like takes that form of an abusive relationship. Yeah, and that's basically it. short answer. Yeah, cults do that a lot. They have the exact same, uh, very much the same build and organization as an abusive relationship. Sorry, I stepped in on somebody else's explanation. Fafner, what do you think the plot is? Well, you know, the the plot is, you know, uh, it was kind of a downer after the last episode, but uh, we're we're coming back up, you know, series is going back upwards as we, uh, as Lane realizes that, um, you know, she doesn't have to just take, hey, you don't exist from God. Yeah. And then Lane says, no, you don't exist. And God's like, shit, fuck, damn it. He's right. We're doing that JRPG thing where we're just going to kill God. <laughs> and yes, she just managed to kill God, A, by rejecting him, but also B, by doxing everybody else who believes in him. So the uh, plot of the uh, series has led to, hey, fucking dang, doxing, look. <laughs> look at the internet itself just doxing An entire group out of existence. Yep. My answer for this is that cults are bad. We'll be back next week with episode 11. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.